before we get too far out on the line, let's see if Bob's here. Oh, Bobby! Hey, Bobby! Hey, Bob, don't hammer us, man. Just pray for us. <laughs> Turn your phones right off. Here, Father Guy, thank you so much for... Uh, Oh, for a wonderful dinner, Father Guy. Pray that it just yes, Lord, yes, he's close. Uh, get ready to fill our, fill our hearts with your word, Father God. Help us to leave this place a little more faith than we stepped in with, Father God. We yes. love you, praise him. We just want to give you glory to see you. Amen. So no matter how much you know or how much you think you know or how close you feel you are to God, you're still a human being. You're still sitting inside your pelt with blood and flesh and means you're going to fall down, you're going to trip, you're going to stumble. The Lord knows you're going to stumble. He ain't surprised by it. That's why he made communion because he says when you stumble, man, just come close to me and ask me to forgive you and I will set it straight for you right, off the, right out of the get-go. So... That's why we do communion, because Jesus told us to. And there's a lot of guys in this room that are stumbling and tripping around that are trying to make it, but man, they're still trying. They're still in the game, right? So uh, tonight I'm going to ask Jesse to bring the, uh, the communion. Well, before anything, you know, we just want to give reverence to the Lord this evening for being who he is and faithful yep. to his word and just allowing all of us in here tonight to gather and enjoy a meal together and to just to have the privilege to, to listen to Ben speak tonight and share God's word with us. So whatever you're holding on to over your head, whatever's hindering your walk with the Lord right now, let's just let's just let it go and lay that at the feet of the cross. Yes, yeah. Lord, just your corpse. So this, this, this symbolizes the blood that was poured out for our sins, for my sins, for your sins. There's no sin too great that can that can outdo this blood that was shed for us and the beating that he took for us, uh, the torment, the pain, the suffering that none of us could ever imagine or fathom what kind of whooping, you know, no matter how hard we think we are or how tough we think we are, Jesus took that for us. So let's just take the blood together and remember it. Thank you, Jesus Christ. And the, and the bread, the mm. bread that was broken, as his body, his body broken, and you know it's just uh, it's a powerful thing. So if you take this and you're not taking it seriously, you can really set yourself up for failure or evil work. You can say you die. So let's take this body with reverence for the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. So the bread, the bread is, uh, Jesus said, by his stripes you're healed. Amen. Some of you guys here tonight got different things going on in your body that ain't right. You ain't your body. You're just, it's, a, it's just a pelt that you're being able to use for a while. And when you're done with it, you're going to move on to another thing. Your body's going to stay here. But the Lord gave us a body and he said the reason he took those stripes is so that we could be healed. Now there's, there's preachers on TV That'll say if you're sick and there's something wrong with you and you don't get healed, it's because you got a lack of faith. I ain't gonna argue with them preachers, uh, but I just thought it was all—it was particularly cruel to, to hammer somebody and tell them the reason they're sick is it's their own fault, basically. I don't know about how the whole healing thing works. It's like there's probably—I don't know—I'm just guessing. Maybe there's a few guys in here could could maybe lift 300 pounds. I don't know. I, there's probably nobody except me in here could lift for 350. <laughs> but I got to tell you, uh, 350 ounces with one arm, Mike, maybe. But, <laughs> but I want to tell you, if you wanted to lift 300 pounds, you could, but it would take some time. It just takes some time. You, if, if you just grab 300 pounds now, you're not going to be able to lift it. It's just going to come down and snap your head off because... <laughs> It's, a, it's an inanimate object. It's iron and it's heavy. But if you really want to lift it, you can maybe start try with maybe a real lightweight, like maybe 200 pounds, and see if you can lift that for a while and then work your way up. Healing is kind of like that. That's what I believe. You, sometimes the Lord will train you in how you should go, and just because you don't get healed from something doesn't mean that He's not ultimately going to heal you. <laughs> now that's how some people look at it. And I'm, I'm just giving you a couple of examples. I wasn't going to talk about this tonight, 
but the Holy Spirit, I just try to find a follow the Holy Spirit because if I don't follow the Holy Spirit and I don't tell you what I'm supposed to tell you, then I'm going to get hammered. So there's no one in this room tonight. I love all you guys. I want to see you prosper. I want to see you start businesses. I want to see you climb the mountain. I want to see you be witnesses where people says whatever that guy wants, I want some of that. I want to see all of you do that. But at the end of the day, I've got to take care of myself and my family. And if I, if I don't do what the Lord wants me to do, then I'm going to get hammered. So I don't have any good ideas. I just kind of, kind of my, as someone asked me the other day, are you preparing for Bible study? I said, wouldn't that be great? I can just sit down and write some stuff out. What do you do with this? Well, when you make those tapes for Mike, do you prepare those? I said, well, I, I, I can't. Just of course. You just have to say, Lord, whatever you want to do, and then go. And you just go. So I'm just telling you, we're talking about healing tonight because maybe, maybe somebody here tonight's confused about that. Because you love Jesus, you know God, you know by your stripes you're healed, and yet... Still sick, you're still not healed. So my wife has had this vertigo for she woke up with it like three or four days ago. She can't I you know, to take her to a hair appointment. I said to a what? Get a driver down to to and then go back and pick her up and and uh, she can't go to work and she can't even hardly feed the dog. She bends over, she gets all dizzy and she got leans up against the wall and she's real upset by all that. And I'm thinking to myself, vertigo sounds kind of cool to me. <laughs> but, and I told her that, and she got mad at me. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> But yeah, hey, let's get some vertigo, dude. <laughs> so, but she's really upset by all of it because Easter's coming up, and she doesn't really know what to do. So she comes in my office, and she says this morning, she says, I, I don't know why I'm not being getting healed. Because I believe and I know the Lord does that and, and I know He always touches and heals you and I just don't know what to do. I guess I'm going to have to go to the doctor. And I said, you got to roll whichever way you got to roll. I said, you know, you watch these guys on TV that tell you one thing, but when it gets right down to the fact when it's you and not some guy on TV, maybe it's a little bit different. She goes, well, what do you mean? I said, honey, I have been stepping out into the dark for 45 years and I don't know how to give you advice because there really isn't any way to explain around it you're you either step out and go or you don't and dozens literally dozens of times in my life they tell me that I was going to die if you don't let us operate on you you'll be dead in the morning and uh, I mean I, I just I won't bore you with a lot of stories but I want you to hear this so you could use me as an example it's not me I didn't do anything to deserve any of this. All I did <coughs> was look at a risen Savior and take him at his word. That's all I did. And then, and then I moved my feet, not my mouth. You know, I was in a wreck where some people got killed. It was a terrible and dismembered and maimed. And I'm in the hospital. It's you know, it an old 69, or, uh, 69 uh, El Dorado, one of those... those, uh, those, those uh, Speedometer is about that long, you know, that goes all the way over to 120 and it's bouncing on 110. And I looked over at my buddy and I said, hey man, you know, that car in front of us stopped. He went around the other lane, there was a King Cake 4x4 Ford uh, F250, 4, 450 coming the other way, doing about 70, and we hit head on. So a lot of people got maimed and killed. and. I, no seat belts and the way we used to roll in those days the three of us would all be in the front seat and there was three of us in the car so there was nobody in the back we were all in the front with no seat belt when I opened my eyes I didn't know where we were the, the hood was all the way up in there about 14 feet up over the top and the engine was on our lap and I thought we was in a ditch and my first inclination was back this thing up and get out of here before the cops come <laughs> but that wasn't happening and so I'm in the hospital and they said well uh, your aorta valve tore all the way open and it's just, it's just spitting blood everywhere. And so I, this Dr. Shapiro said I came up from L.A. to do the operation and you just need to sign this form here. And I was laying there in this bed and they're pumping blood out of me because my heart wasn't working right. And my buddy was dead. My other buddy was, done, was on the way to being dead. And 
I said, nah, ain't nobody dicking around with my heart. So he tried tough love. He backed up and he says, well, then you'll die. I said, yeah, it's okay. I'm, if, if God's done with me, I'm done with me. And they looked over at my mom and my wife and a few people and they all went, my mom says, you know, you got to let him operate. I said, no, nah, if God's finished with me, then, then I'm finished with me. That's, that, that's all there is to it. So I'll see you all on the other side, but ain't nobody going to cut my chest open. So they left and the next morning I woke up, I was still there. The morning after that, I was still there. Then they made some excuse about how they made a mistake or they couldn't explain it or whatever. But a week later, I was back in my office. I had him tell me that I had deep vein thrombosis and if I didn't go to the hospital for a month and thin my blood down, it was, that it was going to move to my heart or my brain and it was going to kill me. And I said, well, you know what? If, if God's done with me, I'm done with me. So I, I spent, I can go on and on and on, but I spent most of my life saying, you know, to me, it doesn't seem like dying. It's like some kind of a bad thing. If God's done with you, what do you want to hang around for? So that's my attitude toward following the Lord. He either is who he says he is, or he ain't. And if he ain't, then I vote that we all go down to, the, to, uh, to a good bar, get some whiskey and a couple hookers, and let's live it up. But if he is who he says he is, let's not just sit around and play games. That's right. The only way you're going to find out if God is who he says he is is what you do with your feet, not your mouth. I'm going to tell you something tonight. Of course. I'm going to tell you something for true tonight. Your mouth will save your soul. Amen. Oh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, Faith is made in the heart and confession is made with the mouth unto salvation. Yes. Your mouth will save your soul. But only your feet will save your destiny. You can bypass all the things that God had for you here on the earth. Miss all of it and still go to heaven. And the way you miss all of it is by what you do with your feet. Just course. So, my wife got in her car. She's driving to work. So she came back home this afternoon. I talked to her and I said, so how'd it go? She goes, uh, I think I'm better. <laughs> I'm not dizzy no one. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? It's like the guy that's broke. I said, hey man, put something out there. Plant some seeds so God can come back around and bless you. And if you need a lot of blessing, you need to give a lot. If you just want a little blessing, give a little. That's not my idea. Jesus said if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. It's no big mystery. If you got a big need, you guys should be given a big offering to something. Find some dirtbag that can't pay you back that's on his last leg and give a bunch of money to him. It's really simple. <laughs> and then what happens? All of a sudden, it all starts coming back to you. I, I'm not making this stuff up. It's all in the book. So what's interesting... Tonight, when I told you when I sent you out this email, we end up with Palm Sunday week, where we are in John 12 on Palm Sunday. So I said, Lord, there's got to be something to that for all the guys, and me included. Give us something that will boost our faith so that we can receive you. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It says, those that go to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. For those that go to him that don't believe will receive nothing. So you have to believe. So how do you believe? Well, I, I can't tell you what to believe or how you should feel. I can tell you things from the Holy Spirit that may change how you feel and what to think, but I can't tell you what to think or how to feel. There's some guys I remember back in the day that were dating girls, and I swear before, I swear they were outside the restaurant chewing on a tire on my car. <laughs> and, and I begged them to leave that thing alone. It was almost anti-human, but I couldn't change how they felt about her. <coughs> I couldn't change how they, they thought she was just down there cleaning her teeth on the valve stem. I don't know what they were thinking. But I couldn't change how they thought about her. I couldn't change how they, that, their feelings that they had. I can't tell you how you should believe in God or how you shouldn't believe in God. All I can say is give you an example and say, this is what I did and that's what God did. 
If you want to do that, you can do it yourself, but I can't, all I can do is give you examples in, of my own life in the Bible, right? So, if we go to, to John 12, I'm going to read you something. And I think it'll be something that you maybe never saw before. I hope so. I hope so. So Jesus is coming down the road and he gets on the donkey and the people all came out and they start putting down palm branches start saying Hosanna Hosanna to God on the highest because he's the Messiah he's going to deliver us Hosanna means save now right Jesus riding into Jerusalem to the east gate was prophesied 571 years earlier by Ezekiel. It said that he would enter the eastern gate. It also says in Revelation that that's where he's going to come back, through the eastern gate. Do you know that about seven, 800 years ago, the Muslims concreted over the eastern, eastern gate with 16 feet of steel and concrete so that nobody could get through that gate because they know the prophecy. And they also put all their burials. I've been to Israel and I walked through there and saw all of it. The whole side of the hill has thousands of graves. So the only way you can walk up to the gate is if you walk through a graveyard. And in the Jewish tradition, if you touch a grave, you're ceremonially unclean and you can't enter the temple. So they have all these plans to keep Jesus from entering in to that gate. But there's something that the disciples said and I was just looking for it. I was just looking for it. It says that when he rode through to the eastern gate, I gotta find this for you. So you guys are just gonna have to sit there for a minute because it's important. It's important. happened to it. Well, it's in, it's in the 12th chapter. You find it yourself. <laughs> Here's what happened. And this is, this is the message. This is what you need to hear. This is what's important. It says, the Bible says that When Jesus came through the eastern gate, he was with the disciples, that they didn't realize that it was prophetic until after Jesus was died and came back from the grave. It says right in John 12, the disciples did not realize that he was fulfilling a 571-year-old prophecy. So in other words... In other words, Jesus didn't say, Hey, fellas, today we're going to fulfill a 571-year-old prophecy from Ezekiel. And you guys are going to be able to see it. He didn't say nothing. And it says in the Bible, in John 12, that the disciples didn't realize that it had all been fulfilled in their presence until after Jesus was killed and came back from the grave. Do you know, I did a little bit of study, and I just want to tell you these things to see what it, see what it does to you. Did you know that 50% of the entire book of John, 50%, half of the entire gospel of John is in the last five days of Jesus' life? 50% of it. 
You think maybe that might be an important time? Do you think every single thing in every single sequence might be important? Well, of course it is. So what is it he's trying to tell us? You can read it, you can listen to the preacher give you a sermon on it, but it, sometimes, I don't know, man, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other if I can't see the significance of it. The significance of this story is the disciples, I wrote this down, the disciples, they didn't stage the event. They had nothing to do with it. They did not stage the event. They just went along with Jesus one day at a time. Listen, a lot of you guys think that you need to get a word from God before you go to Belize. You need to get a word from God before, before you'll come down and do something around the clubhouse. You need a word from God before you'll go help out at the church. You need, you need to know it's a direction from God. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's a trap from Satan to give you a life that sucks. <laughs> Take each day the Lord will lead you and guide you where he wants you to go. And if you understand that your salvation is gotten with words, but your destiny is gotten with your feet, then you start to understand that God has stuff that he wants for you to do. And as you move into it and trust him from day to day, you'll see that he's leading you and guiding you. How many people can look back 10, 20 years from now and see God's hand in where you live now? Who you're married to, where your, where your kids came from, where you're working, who your friends are, what being a member of Soldiers of the Cross. It's so easy to look back and see all that the Lord has done, and that's what the disciples did. They realized, hey, listen, God was in all that. If you can believe that, just bring it around 180 and put that on the dashboard of your truck or your car and say where we're going, he already knows about that. He's in control of everything. Oh, Jesus, of course. He has a plan and he has a destiny for you. And if, if you'll just believe with your feet and not just your mouth. you got to believe with your feet. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord looks to and fro throughout the entire earth looking for a man whose heart would completely trust him so that he can show himself strong to that man. Now listen, he says the entire earth, not just Jerusalem, not just the city, not just the continent. The reason it's the whole earth is because there's not that many. He's the wise he having to look so hard over the whole earth. There's not that many. Every man in here has the capacity, if they'll look at what's happened in the past and know that God had his hand on him there and he's got his hand on him in the future, each man has the capacity to be that man that God wants to show himself strong to. But you will not get it done quoting scriptures with your lips. You will not get it done talking about the things that you think you want to do for the Lord. You will only get that done by your, by your feet, moving your feet. <coughs> Psalms, Psalms 51.50 says, I will call on the Lord in a time of trouble, and he will rescue me, and I will bring him glory. Everybody wants to go to the third part. It's especially true. You don't have to believe me. Pick out any one of a dozen churches. Just pick one. Open the Bible and close your eyes and put a finger on one and drive down to it on Sunday. And you'll see everybody in there oh, for half an hour. They all want to get to, let's give God glory. I feel like going down the aisles and tapping them on the shoulder. Excuse me, I don't, inter don't, don't mean to interrupt your praise, but uh, would you mind if I took a look at your checkbook? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Just so I can kind of see what your feet are doing and see if they're matching all that hand stuff. See, everybody wants to get to the third part. And I will give him glory. Nobody wants to have to talk to God when they're in trouble. But check it out. Without trouble, there's no rescue. Amen. Come on, please, of If Tyson calls me up on the phone and says, Hey, I got a flat on my truck. I can't get a hold of anybody. Can you come pick me up? And I go pick him up. I take him down to McCoy Tire. That's a ride. 
If Tyson calls me up and he goes, I got one minute left on my cell phone. We're going down. I'm two miles off of Dega Bay. We're going to drown out here. Can you help us? And I get a helicopter and go out there and hover over while they're floating there in the water and pluck them out of the water. That's a rescue. Amen. One is a ride. One is a rescue. Why am I telling you that? Well, because some of you are so stupid you don't know the difference. <laughs> We're talking about destiny. We're talking about the disciples not knowing that God had done all these things on Palm Sunday until later. We're talking about being able to move with your feet to affect your destiny. Well, that's what it's about. And 90% of the people, probably 99, when the trouble's involved. But I didn't write the book. Call on me in your time of trouble and I will rescue you. And you will bring me glory. Amen. If you're up for that, the next time something comes about your way, and it looks like it might be trouble, ask yourself a question. Do I trust God to pull me out of this? I don't care if it's telling a doctor to hit the road, or whether it's writing money and you ain't God, or maybe leaving that girl to chew on your tire and go find another one. So, to uh, Sunday, I just want to see if we should do this or not. We got this fire pit here that Mike built. And we're going to take it out in the parking lot. We're going to have a sunrise service. Larry's going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Back yeah, well, because he might not be here much longer, speaking of trouble. So Larry's going to speak. It'll be short and sweet. Well, maybe we'll get some donuts, have a time of fellowship for a sunrise service. Sunrise is at 629, so maybe we get together like at 6. And uh, Larry will, at 630, will give us a, a message. We'll, we'll worship the Lord a little bit. Uh, Larry, he sings like a bird, you know, so maybe he'll lead us a few songs. He can lead us in a couple songs, maybe. <clears throat> so how many would like to go to a sunrise service here on Sunday? Looks like a pretty good crew. And that gives you plenty of time to, you know, get back home uh, and get and get to your own church on Sunday morning or pick up family or whatever. It'd, it'd just be sort of all of us at a sunrise service. To honor the Lord here, out here on the parking lot, I think it'd be great. I didn't have my hands up. <laughs> I'm telling you, you guys don't believe it. He sings like a bird. He's talking about a bird. So I will see. Hey, thank you guys for the cake. I appreciate that and the honor. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, that's it, uh, Dennis. You want to pray us out of here? Jesus talks. Father God, thank you for being in our lives. Thank you for giving our lives purpose. Yeah. Bless yes, this Lord, yeah. Jesus talks. Thank you for this special time where we remember you, God, and honor you. And you bless us. In your name I pray. Yes, you are safe tonight. Amen. Amen.